Rebuilding a Stuart Models Twin Launch Model Steam Engine. This is part 12, finishing the crankshaft. The crankshaft has been on the bench for about 3 or 4 days, so the Loctite should be fully cured by now. And what I'm doing at the moment is getting ready to pin all of the parts together. And the first operation is to use a centre drill to make a mark on each of the crankwebs. It's essential to use a centre drill on a job like this. I need to get the mark in the middle of the crankwebs. And a centre drill, which is a very short, stubby twist drill, allows me to do this. If I use the long, thin and slender twist drill, it would wander all over the place and possibly break. Now some people would use mathematics and gauges to do this, but I tend to do it by eye. I've been doing it for quite a long time, so I don't find it difficult. It's not exactly rocket science, but you do need to practice and I would recommend getting some scrap pieces of metal and just practice with a centre drill first followed by a twist drill drilling all the way through. You will notice that a thin twist drill will wander a little bit so it's not bound to come out of the other end in exactly the same place as it went in. So it's quite important to start the drilling operation exactly in the centre of the crankwebs or as near as you can get it. I'm using some lubrication on this drill. I use my mixture of steam oil and rapeseed oil with a bit of machine oil. And now and again, you can't see it, it's just off camera. But I just touch the drill with some of this oil and it stops the drill from binding. It's very much a feel situation. As the drill proceeds through the work, first of all through the crank web, which is mild steel, you can feel that it's quite soft and it's cutting very well. When drilling holes in pieces of metal, you must give the drill some time to cut. Don't put too much pressure on, otherwise the drill will break. And even if it's a large drill, that will also break, because what will happen is it will get blunt first, then it will get too hot, then it will grab in the work and break off. And then you end up with a pin in the hole that you don't really want, the pin of course being a broken twist drill. It's also very important to back off the drill frequently to just clear the chips. And if the drill bit starts to make a loud crackling noise, you must back off immediately and clear the chips. Otherwise the drill will break. That's the drilling out of the way, and I'm quite relieved. It's fairly nerve-wracking, particularly when you're trying to operate a video camera at the same time. So now what I'm doing is using some cellulose thinners or lacquer thinners, and I'm cleaning off all of the oil residue. I was using oil to lubricate the drill bit, and this now needs to be fully removed before I put Loctite 603 into the holes and drive in the pins. And the next part of the job is to make the pins. I bought a piece of silver steel. This is very hard steel, and you can harden it even further if you wish, but there's really no need to do that in this application. I'm cutting the pins to size, but I'm purposely cutting them oversize, for the simple reason that if I cut them exactly to the crankweb size, the hammer will be pounding onto the crankweb, and I don't want this to happen. I know some of you watching must be thinking, I wish you'd cut that middle piece out so it looks like a crankshaft, but not yet. That is very much the last job. I've filled the holes with some Loctite 603, and I'm hammering the pins into place. These are hard silver steel pins and they're a very good fit in the hole. Running the full length of my workbench, I have two pieces of steel bar. And they are seven and a quarter inches apart. And I use these as rails for when I work on seven and a quarter inch gauge model steam engines. And it turns out that they really are ideal for this job. The crankweb sits on the piece of metal bar and I can hammer away to my heart's content and when the tone of the hammer blow changes, I know that the pin is fully down onto the steel bar. The centre part of the crankshaft is still in one piece, and I will not be cutting this out until all the ultraviolence has finished. And I cannot overstress how important it is when building up a crankshaft in this way, irrespective of the size of the crankshaft. Some people have asked me, can you do this with bigger crankshafts? And the answer is yes, provided that you're careful. These pins have to be a very tight fit. You can't just bang soft pins in. When I was messing about with the previous crankshaft, I used a taper pin. These are no good, they're far too soft. You need to use hard silver steel pins like these. 
and it's also vital that they are a tight fit in the holes. Really, I don't need to use Loctite on these, the pins are tight enough. But I never want them to come out, and it will make the job even stronger. If you take another look at the previous episodes where I'm covering making this crankshaft, you will see that the crank webs are a very easy fit on both the crank pins and the central shaft. Not a rattle fit, it's a bearing fit. And if you do it this way, the whole thing is in harmony, it's not stressed. And as you can now see, it's all pinned together, and the pins are sticking out quite a lot on one side. But this is not a problem in the slightest. I will just make my way to the outer part of the workshop and sort this out. This is the dirty part of the workshop. This I would call a linisher. It's really a belt sander. I don't know where the word linisher comes from. It's something I learned when I trained very briefly as an electronics engineer when I was about 16 years old, which is now a long, long time ago. But anyway, they stuck me in the machine shop drilling holes and I really didn't like that, so I left. And I joined a rock and roll band and that was the end of it. This is the part of the workshop where I do things like this. What I'm doing is profiling the crankshaft. The crank webs need to be rounded, not left square. And it takes a while to do, and it gets very hot, and I burn my fingers, but I do have a pot of water right next to the linisher. And although it's not shown in this video clip, the crankshaft goes into the pot of water along with my fingers very frequently to keep it cool. If I get the part too hot, the Loctite will let go. And here I'm trimming the sides of the crank webs because I left them a little bit too wide. So now the end is near and I face the final curtain as the song goes. I'm about to cut out the centre part of the main shaft. And whatever you do if you're doing a job like this, don't get too worked up or excited and do not ever cut out the crank pin by accident. Guide the blade. The blade will try and dig into the metal, keep it away from the metal, Put a little bit of bias so it comes towards you. You can always file off the ends. I didn't do it at this speed. That, of course, was speeded up. And so is this. Now I'm using the one-inch belt sander to clean up the inside edge of the crank webs. A job like this is not difficult. And yes, I know it's OK for me to say that I've been doing it for a long time. But I didn't find it that difficult 40 years ago. It's very time-consuming. And 40 years ago, I did, of course, used to make about three of everything before I got one right. But now, thankfully, I'm older and wiser. Well, older anyway. I'm just cleaning off all the residue with some cellulose thinners, and now it's into the lathe. And not unsurprisingly, the crankshaft runs very true. The right-hand side of the crankshaft is a long way from the left-hand side where it sticks out of the chuck. And it's not wobbling about, not like the other one. And this will be a very serviceable crankshaft. All I need to do is give it a bit of a polish with some very fine wet to dry sandpaper and fit it to the engine. In the clip currently on screen, I'm just holding the crankshaft into the main bearings and rotating it, and everything feels really good. It feels very true. So now I can start to put the engine back together. There may be one or two other parts to make, but nothing quite so major as the crankshaft. I think I'll take this opportunity to give the base yet another coat of paint. I'm lightly rubbing down the component in between coats. It's never going to look as good as a paint job on a car, but it will look fine for what it is. It is, after all, a casting of the base of a model steam engine. And most of the full-size ones, as far as I'm aware, were painted with brushes. This paint is Humbrol Black Enamel. And while the lid is off the paint pot, I will give the inside of the wooden base another coat. So that's coat number three on the inside of the base. What I'm doing at the moment is painting the circular part that's in the centre of the steam chest cover. It was, of course, as you can clearly see, green, but it looks a bit wrong in green now the engine is black. And that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.